Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to speak on the Higher Education Support Legislation Amendment, a more sustainable, responsive and transparent Higher Education System Bill 2017. This is an unfair bill which would rip billions of dollars from our universities, increase fees for students and saddle them with a greater debt. It would mean Australian students have to repay more sooner for a poorer quality education. At a time when we should be investing in our universities and TAFEs, this bill locks in nearly $4 billion of cuts over five years. This comes on top of an attempt by the government to abolish the $3.7 billion Education Investment Fund. Teaching, student programs and university facilities will all suffer. The cuts also damage Australia's research effort. Labor will oppose this unfair, economically irresponsible legislation. Consequently, I move that all the words after that be omitted with a view to substituting the following words that this House declines to give the bill a second reading because the bill 1. cuts university funding by nearly $4 billion, 2. hits students with higher fees, 3. saddles students with bigger debts which they will have to pay back at the same time as they are trying to buy a house or start a family, 4. compromises teaching and learning and undermines research, and 5. slashes investment in universities at a time when the government should be investing in both universities and TAFEs in order to guarantee a strong and productive economy. Mr Speaker, Labor opposes this bill because there is no more important investment a government can make than in education. A strong education system is both a contributing factor to economic growth and a dividend from it. At a time when Australia's economy is transitioning from the resources boom to a more diverse knowledge-based economy, we must ensure that young Australians have the skills that they need to compete in the global economy. While so many countries around the world are increasing their investment in the skills of their people to ensure that they are well placed to compete, this government is doing the exact opposite. Research tells us that by 2020, two out of every three jobs created in our country will require a diploma or higher qualification. We need more Australians with post-school qualifications. We should be encouraging participation in university and in TAFE, not putting up barriers with higher fees and higher debts. Children who started school this year will enter the tertiary education system in 2030. Will our post-secondary system provide them with the best opportunity to get the skills they will need in a vastly more globalised, more technology-driven world? By that time, we'll be almost a third of the way through this Asian century. We should be preparing right now to seize the opportunities that that brings. A clever approach would have us investing in our people. Yeah. But this bill is anything but clever, and it certainly doesn't invest in our future. In fact, it puts additional burdens and additional barriers in the way of our people. You can't ensure that we are set up for the challenges and opportunities of the future through cuts through cuts and cost shifting. That's not reform. We've waited two and a half years now for a government bill for higher education. We were waiting, something, we were waiting for something better than the cuts of the Abbott Pine era. But sadly, it's just cuts that we've got again. That's what we've come to expect from this government when it comes to higher education. As I said back in February on a matter of public importance debate, the one job the new education minister has been given find $3 billion worth of cuts in the university sector. I said it then and I stand by that now. The education minister has overperformed in only one area of his portfolio, and that's the cuts that he's managed to find. He's managed nearly $4 billion of cuts, $3.8 billion over five years. And of course, if you add in the $3.7 billion that he's trying to uh, abolish with the uh, abolition of the Education Investment Fund. So we're talking about a total of almost 8 
$1.6 billion cut from tertiary education alone. Despite the former uh, Prime Minister telling universities before the 2013 election that they should experience what he called a period of benign neglect. Well, he got the neglect part right, <laughs> but it has been anything but benign. The Liberals have talked a lot. There's been, you wouldn't believe it, 29 reviews into higher education, reviews, inquiries, talk fests. Uh, that's cost the taxpayer more than $4.7 million. And you would think with almost $5 million invested in these talk fests, we'd get something a little more nuanced in this new bill. What we've got are the same old cuts. We know that the government couldn't quite convince the Senate to allow fee deregulation, a widespread $100,000 degrees, or a 20 per cent cut to university operating grants. So this minister, the heir to the fixer, um, the heir to the member of Sturt, son of Sturt, as we're calling him, was told to find a way to get cuts and fee increases through a parliament that generally values education. So it's a shame that he has squibbed the opportunity for real reform and instead presented a package of measures that are just a series of cuts dressed up with minor tinkering around the edges, and he's calling that a reform package. It's simply a return to the Liberals' only idea for universities, which is cut funding for operating uh, expenses and charge students more. It's what happened in the Howard years. It started with Amanda Vanstone's devastating cuts to universities in the horror 1996 budget. That's when we first saw full fee degrees. Um, that was, in fact, the first $100,000 degree that we saw in the uh, Australian market. And we saw, of course, um, at that time as well, the introduction of differential hex, when the Liberals hiked fees from $2,442 per year to $5,500 per year. Uh, and then we saw, after Amanda Vanstone, um, Brendan Nelson jacked up student fees again when he had the education portfolio. Um, this is all part of a pattern. So, what we've seen is a minister who is uh, heir to the tradition, uh, who is in fact claiming the exact opposite. He's claiming that there is an increase to resources for universities, when we know what we're seeing is a real funding cut. The Chief of Universities of Australia said just today, credit um, uh, said that just today that there is. Uh, in fact, a real funding cut to our universities, not an increase, as the minister claims. But um, credit where credit is due, uh, at least the current education minister has managed to do one thing that the former education minister, the member for Sturt, couldn't do. He has managed to unify the university sector. He's managed to get institutions that are sometimes not on a unity ticket when it comes to university funding, he has unified them for the first time in many a year in opposition to his legislation. I note that Universities Australia said on the 16th of May, and I quote, an overwhelming majority of vice chancellors agree that they could not recommend that the Senate crossbench pass this legislative package. The group of eight said, and I quote, the G08 is committed to an economically sustainable higher education system for Australia, but this package, for which we were not consulted, is fatally flawed in multiple ways and will severely harm Australia's highly successful university system. Many vice chancellors have written to me directly, voicing their concerns about this legislation. Just a few examples. The vice chancellor of the University of Western Australia, Professor Dawn Freshwater, says, and I quote, I'm also concerned that the changes to the help, fees and repayment thresholds may discourage students, particularly for rural, remote and low SES parts of our community, from attending university. You would think that the Nationals had a thing or two to say about that. Apparently not. Um, Martin Bean, the Vice-Chancellor of RMIT, said, and I quote, we believe Australia 
must have a strong, sustainable and affordable tertiary education system that is accessible to all, regardless of background and circumstance. Yeah, right. He continues, I do not agree with funding cuts to universities or an increased cost burden on students. Universities and their students make a vital contribution to Australia's economy and play a critical role in the delivery of innovation and productivity. Uh, Dr Michael Spence, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, has warned about the impact of cuts to our economy. He said, and I quote, negative economic and related impacts in Sydney and New South Wales will be unavoidable given the important role universities play in their local economies and communities. Of course, it's not just limited to Vice-Chancellors. Uh, Vice this month, the Times Higher Education World Ranking Director Phil Batty said, and I quote, now I, I should um, explain to perhaps members opposite who don't understand, um, this is like getting a, a negative warning from a credit rating agency, this comment. Listen to this, and I, uh, I'm quoting now. Australia's leading institutions are already falling behind peers in mainland China and Hong Kong, which receive high and sustained levels of state funding. Funding cuts proposed by the government could seriously harm the country's <coughs> institutions in future editions of the rankings. So the, the people who compile the list, the rankings of the world's best universities, are saying to us, as Australians, if we want to stay in those rankings of the world's best universities, these cuts are exactly the wrong thing to do. If we don't heed this warning, we are nuts. This bill deals with more than 12 measures from the government's higher education package, which it released in May. But it's very, um, I, I think, uh, unreasonable to call this, as the government does, a reform package, because reform is generally meant to improve things. Yeah. It's about investing in our people. It's about nation building. This bill isn't reform. It is a wasted opportunity. This bill will cut university operating grants, the Commonwealth Grant Scheme, by 2.5 per cent over the years 2018 and 2019. It hikes up fees for Australian students by 7.5 per cent over four years. It also requires students to pay off their larger debts sooner, with new repayment thresholds starting at $42,000, and changes in the way these rates are indexed. It forces New Zealand citizens and permanent residents off Commonwealth-supported places and requires them to pay full fees, just like any other international student from any other country. It cuts the number of Commonwealth-supported postgraduate places by 3,000. It forces students in enabling courses to pay fees for the first time and threatens universities with existing funding for enabling courses by putting these uh, places out to tender. It will see, for the first time in Australia's higher education system, the introduction of a voucher system for the allocation of postgraduate places and hand the distribution of those around 34,000 places over to someone, not really sure who, some unnamed entity. This mystery body could be potentially pretty much anyone, could, could be one of the existing organisations, could be a new organisation, could potentially be a private company. Um, Voucher systems in education, like, honestly, this is not reform. No. We've been provided with a per, um, perfunctory amount of detail in this bill about these very substantial changes, as well as a range of other measures. The government's glossy brochure distributed to representatives of university and uh, um, the media contains little uh, enough comment uh, on some of the details of this. We thought that individual measures would be more thoroughly outlined in the budget. They weren't. In fact, the entire package uh, rated only two lines in the budget. 
the one thing the government has admitted is the magnitude of the savings, and that's $3.8 billion over five years. But it took until July for the minister to outline how much each measure would cost or save. And last year, the same universities uh, that have um, been struggling along with this uncertainty since the election of those opposite were forced onto one-year funding agreements to accommodate the government's policy inertia in this area. They're now once again struggling to uh, scramble to work out how they can um, deal with these cuts, uh, including the performance um, payments cuts that they're you know, scant detail of now. Students, of course, uh, are the real victims of all of this. It's students who are uh, wondering whether they will be able to afford to go to university. Mr Speaker, this bill leaves us with as many questions as it answers. One vice-chancellor said to me, and I quote, this is not reform, it's merely a series of thought bubbles wrapped around <coughs> a funding cut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a perfect description. Uh, just looking at some of those measures that I mentioned in a little bit more detail, this bill reserves 7.5 per cent of Commonwealth grant scheme funding for a yet-to-be-determined performance-based funding system. We all know, uh, all we know about the operation of this funding system is what we heard from the Assistant Minister for Vocational Education in her second reading speech. Uh, that next year the funding will flow to universities based on whether they provide certain data. Details to come later. It's a, really like the government expecting the university just to sign here, we'll send you the bill afterwards, you know, mm -hmm. give us your credit card, sign here, we'll send you the bill some other time. In the meantime, 7.5 per cent of the Commonwealth Grant Scheme, uh, around $500 million a year, will be held back, taken from the universities, held back by the government, handed to the minister to distribute as he sees fit. It is an extraordinary thing to create a $500 million slush fund for the minister in such uncertain circumstances. The proposal doesn't meet the most basic standards of good governance and completely lacks transparency. Moreover, this sort of un uncertainty, uh, you know, being at the at the mercy of ministerial fiat, does not provide the kind of certainty that this sector needs to plan for staffing, building, student numbers, all of the things that they need to project years into the future. Universities cannot assume, for budgetary purposes, that they'll ever receive that seven and a half percent of funding that they're actually entitled to uh, under um, existing legislation. So how is any organisation, particularly one of the size and complexity of a university, supposed to budget with that kind of uncertainty? And then you put that on top of the 2.5% efficiency dividend, you could see university grants cut by up to 10%. That would be devastating. Swinburne University of Technology says that the cuts to the CGS would mean a loss of around $31 million. If you factor for them alone, if you factor in the performance funding changes, this could mean potential revenue loss of around $82 million over five years. So you imagine an institution coping with that scale of uncertainty in their budget. The University of Sydney says the CGS cut would mean a loss for them of more than $50 million. La Trobe University says that cumulative impact of these measures in the bill could impact their budget by up to $126 million over the next four years. Deakin University says that the cuts will both dampen their appetite for risk, especially in the area of innovation, acceleration and product incubation. Honestly, if you were trying to design a package that discouraged universities from taking the risks that will make them fit for purpose in 10 and 20 and 30 years' time so that they're preparing their students in this incredibly rapidly changing world, you couldn't design something that was 
more guaranteed to dampen enthusiasm for actually innovating in our university sector. The bill brings in a voucher system for almost 34,000 postgraduate uh, Commonwealth supported places. There are about 100,000 Australians studying in postgraduate coursework programs uh, in Australia uh, at the moment. It means that students uh, wishing to take a postgraduate coursework program in the future would have to apply to some yet to be determined body for the chance of a Commonwealth supported place. And to make it look prettier, the government's going to call this a scholarship mm. program. Because scholarships sound nice, don't they? Uh, Rebadging Commonwealth supported places as scholarships is just spin. And alarmingly, before a body is set up to administer this new voucher system, uh, this bill would hand the power to allocate those places to the minister. Another blank cheque for another thought bubble. Of course we don't support this kind of uncertainty. And while we believe that there should be reform to what is admittedly an irrational system of allocating postgraduate Commonwealth supported places, there is, this approach is so light on detail uh, and so at the behest of the minister that it is impossible to support it. I want to talk um, very briefly, Mr Speaker, about enabling courses because one of the meanest, meanest parts of this bill is the proposal to introduce for the first time fees for enabling courses and to put these courses out to tender. Enabling courses are actually designed to get people who've missed out uh, the first time round, who've had troubles in high school or who've had a you know, job, job in a sector that uh, is rapidly changing, lost their job, want to retrain, go to university. These enabling courses are programs that are designed to prepare students, including some of our most disadvantaged students, for university study. These courses have been targeted in this bill. So from next year, students taking these courses, who incidentally don't actually end up with a formal qualification from taking these co this course, it's just a, a pathway into university, it's a, a test to the student themselves, do I like this environment, I'll get a little taste of what this university has to offer, will I fit in here, am I interested in this university and what they have to offer, and do I know how to write an essay, do I know how to do the research that's required of me. The students don't get a qualification, they get a taste of university and from next year this government expects them to pay up to $3,200 for that. This is, um, and look I've really got to say, I've visited a lot of universities that have brought some of their best and brightest students in through the front door because of these enabling courses. They would not have got those, if those students Many, from, as I said, from disadvantaged backgrounds had been told they had to pay thousands of dollars to, to t have a taste of university. They would not be there. Those students told me that themselves. And to, add, and to add further insult to this injury, um, these enabling courses are taught by such a passionate group of educators. They are the people who see the best in the student in front of them. Who invest so much in getting that student uh, you know, comfortable with the, the research and essay writing and, and group work that university requires. Those committed, passionate educators, they won't necessarily be offering these courses in the future. They'll all be put out to tender, put out to the lowest cost. So there's no guarantee that students will get the same sort of high standards as they're getting now. It will be devastating for a significant number of universities, particularly those in the regions. In July, for example, I visited Newcastle University's Arimba campus on the Central Coast with my colleagues who are here today. And they told me that um, they, uh, at the Arimba campus, I met 
just a few of the 800 or so students that are taking, under, undertaking enabling courses at that campus. And those students told me exactly the difference that these enabling courses have made in their lives. And they also so they told me about how they're giving them a chance of a university qualification. They're building the skills and confidence uh, in those students. They're helping those students overcome some of the difficulties that they had in high school. They're getting a second chance, and it's a second chance that many of them thought they'd never had. But two or one, every single one of the students I spoke to, when I asked them, would you have paid $3,200 for the opportunity to do this, they said no. I would not have. I would not have had the confidence in myself to risk that sort of money, and for a number of them, I just flat out would not have would not have committed to that debt. Couldn't have couldn't have done it to myself. So we've got people studying so they can better support themselves and their families, being turned away because of these new fees. None of these students would have had the confidence in themselves to risk that sort of debt for an enabling course that doesn't even count as a qualification. It's just a pathway. The member for Newcastle, the member for Dobell, have been particularly uh, um, taking up the case for these enabling courses because the University of Newcastle really is outstanding when it comes to delivering these courses. And I know that they'll speak more about this uh, in, their, in their remarks later on. Um, we won't support attacking these students and we won't support yeah, yeah. putting these enabling courses out to tender to the lowest bidder. Yeah, yeah. Now, just on New Zealanders and uh, yeah. um, New Zealand citizens and, perma and permanent residents, um, look, the, the, hitting these, this group of people, seeing them forced off Commonwealth supported places and onto full fee international places is particularly troubling given that many of these students have been here for years. They've been here for years. They've gone to Australian schools. They speak with Australian accents. They or their families have chosen to call Australia home. They'll be here for years to come. Wouldn't it be a good idea that they could, they could actually get a decent job and contribute to the tax system? They're contributing to our society. They're contributing to our economy. And this higher education opportunity gives them the opportunity of contributing in an even greater way, perhaps for the rest of their working lives. Many of them just want to have the same opportunities that their classmates have got, uh, kids that they've gone to school with in Australian schools. So it's particularly troubling that the government is making these changes at the same time that it's created so much uncertainty around the pathway to citizenship. We won't stand by and make these students pay more for their courses. We know that if New Zealanders who live here and study here, they're likely to make an even greater contribution to Australia's economy and society. We do support some of the measures in this bill. We support the additional funding for vet science and dentistry units. We cautiously welcome the announcement of regional student hubs, although, again, details are scant. Uh, where will they be? How will the sites be selected? Of course, we are uh, very supportive of seeing the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships program um, legislated. It is a policy legacy of Labor. We're sorry that so much money has already been cut from it. Um, but du during the, its years of operation, HEP has helped, uh, along with uncapping of student numbers, boost Indigenous student numbers by 26 per cent, increase regional student numbers by 30 per cent, and helped more than 36,000 additional students from low-income families into university. We're proud of that legacy, and we're very sorry that in the 2014 budget, HEP was cut by $51 million, and then in last year's budget was cut by $152 million. But yes, we'd like to see what the government have left of HEP protected by legislation. We also support the expansion of sub-bachelor places. Uh, it's another uh, recommendation of the Bradley Review. But we have to make sure that this is not at the expense of TAFE. We need a strong university system and a strong TAFE system working in partnership together to give our young people the best possible opportunity 
of getting a great job and to give Australians who are training and retraining to lift their skills the best possible opportunity to do so. We've seen $2.8 billion cut from TAFE, so we don't want to see an expansion of sub-bachelor places at the expense of TAFE. We have a very proud record of higher education, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we will continue to fight to make sure that all Australian students have the opportunity of getting a terrific post-secondary school education, because that's what our modern economy demands of them. It's good for them as individuals, and it's a great investment for us as a nation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thank from 